A Happy Bureaucracy by M. P. Fitzgerald Narrated by Gary Bennett Author's Note Strewn between drug use, groin malice, and cursing on a level tantamount to sacrilege are gratuitous mentions of bureaucracy. These bureaucratic references may not be for the weak of heart. Chapter 2 The cold, uncaring glow of fluorescent lights. The chilled, stale oxygen of recycled air. Arthur was home, and it felt good. Home was safe. Home was underground in a reinforced bunker made of concrete and steel. The only enemy down here was inefficiency, a specter as rare as a ghost. As Arthur marched silently down the concrete corridors of the IRS, he was filled with a sense of hope that was usually punished outside these walls. He was going to be promoted, he was sure of it. And with promotion came the guarantee that he would stay indoors. No longer would he have to risk his life in the harsh United Wastes, sticking his neck out for an audit. No longer would he see another enforcer like Robert die in the line of duty. No longer would he have to be forced to save children who lacked a childhood. He was free. Free to spend the rest of his life in the confines of a concrete cubicle jungle. The black and white checkered linoleum floor beneath him, newly waxed. The bare concrete walls around him, cold and without dust. It was perfection. He walked briskly, doing his best not to dance as he did so, to his shared cubicle. He could not wait to sit, to feel the pleather seat against his back, a seat totally unprepared and designed to deal with a human spine. He could not wait to hear the droning clatter of keys being pressed hurriedly as dozens of people typed at the same time. Most of all, he could not wait to gloat, to brag. He could not wait to fly it all into Ralph Seaman's face. As he turned a corner in the hallway, Arthur was met with a seemingly endless corridor, lined with doors on each side. Though the doors were numbered in the dozens, each with their own alphanumeric numbers, they all led to the same room. It was with this design that Arthur could choose any door, including the first one, and find himself in the same large and cluttered space. This, however, was the bureaucracy, the pinnacle of human OCD. And as a breathing bureaucratic prodigy, Arthur had no choice but to walk down the long corridor until he reached the proper door. He passed a door labeled A13 to A14, and he continued forward. He reached door A19 to A20, and he gave it no attention. It was not until he was at the very last door, A23 to A24, that he stopped. On any normal day, Arthur would not pause outside of this door. He would not consider its steel frame set into a concrete slab. On any normal day, Arthur would simply push the door open. Today, however, was his day. Today would be the last day he identified as Auditor Number 24, and tomorrow there would be a new office drone to fill his pleather seat. Anticipation built inside him, threatening to overtake his calm demeanor with raw joy. With a long, silent breath, Arthur put out his right hand and pushed the door. The deathly quiet of the hallway was immediately assaulted by a flurry of office noise. Light chatter added to the cacophony of keyboards being pressed madly, a rogue sound of creaking split the air as someone far away adjusted their weight in their seat. He would miss this part of the job, but he wouldn't miss the danger of it. Not all of the cubicles were filled, either because some of the auditors were out in the wasteland, demanding taxes from people like Murder Man, or because they were deceased from trying to collect taxes from people exactly like Murder Man. The desks of the dead did not carry tombstones. Instead, they held a folded-over piece of paper, Tiny half pyramids with unassigned written in a polite and bold font. The regularity of the signs were such that no one in the IRS used that font for anything but death. There was only one desk ahead of him, and that was empty, labeled A24. It was his desk, surrounded by a thick wall of concrete, but not completely, to divide it from the other rows. 
This concrete cubicle was the standard in the doomsday office workplace. Beside his empty spot was a young man just like Arthur, staring contemplatively at his computer screen. His blonde hair was parted to the same side as Arthur's, but it came down in a more stringy fashion. He had a face meant for glasses, but wore none, and the stubble of his face threatened to become a beard. Also like Arthur, he wore a white-collared shirt and a black tie, his slacks neatly pressed, and his shoes shined. On his left breast was his work badge with a photograph of him displaying a more clean-cut face. It read, Auditor Number 23, Ralph Siemens, Internal Revenue Services. There was a healthy competition among the auditors. There was also a decidedly unhealthy competition between most of the auditors. Ralph Siemens was not just a man with an incredibly unfortunate name. No, Ralph was a cheat. Arthur highly suspected that most, if not all of the revenue that Ralph collected was scavenged. He had the same enforcer for too long, while Arthur dutifully audited citizens of the Waste, who were almost always not happy to see him. Ralph likely headed to abandoned buildings to collect what canned food or bullets were left there. He once came back with actual money. No one except IRS employees used actual money. They were twenties, but the IRS used $2 bills almost exclusively. Apparently, no one but Arthur was suspicious. It was an insult. Ralph was an insult. To the job, to the operations manual, to everything that the IRS stood for. Ralph Siemens was a cheat, though he would likely tell you he was a survivalist. Well, today, he would be a loser. Arthur sat down at his desk and opened his palm. Ralph immediately placed five $2 bills into it and said, Survived another one, I see. I'm getting real tired of losing this bet. A plastic smile covered the shared contempt they felt for each other. You won't be losing any more, Arthur announced glibly. Ralph shifted uneasily in his chair. A short silence fell between the men. Normally, Arthur would get to work at this point. He would boot up his computer and hammer away at its keys. Not today. He turned to Ralph and finally let the smile that had been fighting its way through his professional demeanor shine. No, Ralph said in mock delight. Arthur nodded. You're finished? You made quota? Finished my last audit today. That's wonderful. Congrats. Though the conversation was genial, only one of them was truly happy. Arthur watched as Ralph clenched his hand tighter around his mouse. Does this mean, Ralph fished. Promotion, said Arthur. Yes. Arthur only smiled in return. Before either could continue their polite charade, a man walked through their door. He was a studious-looking twenty-something and was wearing the same office uniform. He marched forward with a clipboard and a mailbag. Auditor number 24, Arthur McDowell, he asked with a parcel in his hand. Arthur nodded. The man marked a check in his clipboard and stated, You have a summons request from the Deputy Commissioner for Operations Support, Henry S. Boyd. Ralph no longer hid his misery on hearing this, and Arthur's heart skipped a beat. This is it, he thought. This is my promotion. Sign here, the man said. Arthur dutifully signed the release form with a flourish. The man checked the signature, marked another check on his clipboard, and tore out a yellow slip, the carbon copy, and handed it to Arthur. Then he demanded, Sign here on this release for confirmation that you have received your carbon copy. Arthur complied. The man pulled out another carbon copy and handed it to Arthur, and then marked a third check on his clipboard. With his job complete, the man left abruptly without another word. Arthur could feel Ralph's hatred beaming at him like a laser. It was absorbed with another smile. Arthur folded his release receipt neatly, then folded his receipts receipt, and opened a drawer beneath his desk and carefully filed it. He then took a moment to log the receipt in his drawer's inventory manifest and marked the date and time filed. His work done, he turned to the summons. He was at once stunned by the typeface and centering of the form and fought an urge to measure the negative space on the page. This was no mere memo. This was art. 
the page stated no more than it had to. 2. Auditor number 24, Arthur T. McDowell, below ground level 4, hallway A, row 23 to 24, cubicle number 24. You were summoned to see the Deputy Commissioner for Operations Support, Henry S. Boyd, at exactly 2 o'clock p.m. Standard Bunker Time. Henry S. Boyd. The bottom was a dessert he was unprepared for. It was the name, signed, signed. Arthur now had the autograph of one of the most respected and high-ranking officers in the bunker. Bureaucracy could be kind. Ralph could wait no longer. That's it then, isn't it? That's the promotion? Arthur had no problem drawing this out. Let's not assume it could be for anything. Don't be an asshole. We both know what that summons means. The Deputy Commissioner for Operations Support, Henry S. Boyd, does not bring people to his office for chit-chat. You got it, and we both know it. It's going to be an honor to meet him, Arthur said, beaming. Ralph could not help but put away his loathing at hearing this, and his own fandom took over before being replaced with jealousy. It will probably be the last time anybody gets to meet him from our division, he said. He could be promoted to full commissioner any day now. The sentiment was deserved, but Arthur balked at this. The commissioner has held that position since before the war, and he has had it our entire lives. I'm starting to think that he will never die. Boyd won't be promoted anytime soon. You'll get your chance. Arthur wasn't sure if Ralph deserved this kindness, but it was true as legendary as Henry S. Boyd was, he could not move upward until the spot was vacant, and the full commissioner, Jack DeWitt, was never likely to retire. Henry S. Boyd had done much for the agency. He had led the first census, as well as a more tragic second. He had written protocol, allowing auditors to collect revenue used by the new economy. He was not just a good bureaucrat, he was also a maverick. It would not be going too far to say that once Arthur's father died, Boyd became a role model and hero. It was an honor to meet him, let alone receive the accolades of a promotion from him. Accolades that would promise permanent safety for Arthur. Accolades that his father never received. God rest his soul. Ralph muttered something Arthur did not understand, and then declared, Looks like you'll be my new boss. Congrats, Arthur, congrats. Good thing I've been your cubicle buddy since the beginning, so it's okay with me if you play favorites, he smiled. Oh, I'll play favorites, Arthur thought, as he quickly considered sending Ralph to the radioactive craters for an audit. It was something he would never do, send a man to his death, but entertaining the thought was still pleasant. It's a shame we won't be making any more bets, Arthur replied. A shrill, soul-shattering buzz went off in the hallway. It was like broken china making love to a kazoo. It brought pleasure and relief to everyone in a cubicle. It signified one o'clock, lunchtime. As if the room were a single organism, every auditor raised and filed themselves in a queue to leave for the bunker's commons area. Only Arthur stayed seated. It's spam and rice, I'm sure of it, Arthur said confidently as he walked out. Arthur was not surprised by Ralph's eagerness to leave. He never worked anyways. Arthur took a minute to read over his summons once more, and once the rest of his peers were out the door, he followed, elated. He carried the summons with him. The queue for lunch began in the hallways, and then wound its way down to another level, the fifth of eight levels beneath sea level. The line was like a giant millipede, its starched white abdomen held upright by pressed black pants. Lunch breaks lasted for an hour, and the line from Arthur's position took 30 minutes to reach the commons. I think I'll buy myself a coffee, Arthur thought, as he pawed his winnings from Ralph. There was never a need for change, as all rations were a multiple of two, and all notes were two dollars. The two dollar bill was the pride of the IRS. In the 1970s, when the note was first introduced to lackluster success, Americans simply did not want to use it. The IRS played a long game. Not wanting to pulp or waste the money, the government shrink-wrapped most of the bills being rejected by the citizenry and hid them away in a bunker. 
The money was to be used to boost the economy once the bombs fell, and as a reserve to pay for whatever the government immediately needed. It was fine that the citizens of the United States in the 1970s refused to use them. The future citizens of the United Wastes would have no choice. Of course, there was no government to be fueled by this money, and now the bills were used internally and as refunds for the poor wastelander not spry enough to check calories or bullets on their tax return. Arthur, like the rest of the IRS, received his wage through $2 bills, but he was also lucky enough to win every bet he made with Ralph. It was with this extra income that Arthur was able to buy the $8 coffee ration that he enjoyed on a monthly basis. It was the highest treat and social status marker in the bureau. His lunch was spam and rice. The common halls were a wide open gash in an otherwise solid slab of concrete. Rows of seemingly endless elongated community tables lined parallel to each other. They were filled with the last of the civil. Once Arthur's meal was paid for, and even ten dollars, he received a small mug of black coffee and a tray with two scoops of rice and the grilled brick of uncut spam. Arthur never paid the extra two dollars for gravy. Mindlessly, because everything in the IRS has order, he walked over to his assigned seat and sat down. He did not make eye contact with Ralph. Arthur's cafeteria row was right next to where the janitors ate, and Arthur was faced towards them. Everybody except the highest pay grade and the ration cooks ate here, and all at the same time. The table he faced was where he grew up, seated next to his father. The table behind him, where the auditor's supervisors were, is where he will sit next. Arthur was moving on up. He pulled out his summons, to the great annoyance of Ralph, and read it to himself for the third time. He no longer had to worry about the same fate his father met. He no longer had to repeat the phrase, Guns go up, don't frown, fall down, to himself, and pray that no violence met him. More importantly, he could now buy coffee once a week. This was sublime. As he finished reading his summons, but before he gave in to the imperative of eating his rations, he caught something in the corner of his eye at the janitor's table. It was a breakage in uniform height. The row of janitors grew shorter, and Arthur realized it wasn't something he saw. It was someone. Dressed in a denim jumpsuit too big for her was the little girl, dinner, he had saved that morning, greedily shoveling food into her mouth. Arthur smiled. The little girl had already been processed through the revenue storage division. Humans may be considered calories in the new economy, but slavery was illegal in the United States, and the IRS was law-abiding. The fact that there was no more United States was one that fell on deaf ears to the IRS. She was now an employee of the Internal Revenue Services, and so long as she did not do too good a job, she would never be promoted. She would be safe. She was young enough that her PTSD would only be debilitating and not crippling. Arthur fought off the desire to talk to her, to see if she understood that so long as she did not stand out, she wouldn't become an auditor, that she would be safe if she slacked. He wanted to tell her these things because it was not advice that he took seriously at her age. He wished that he knew then that once he was promoted, he would have to be promoted again to be safe once more. But Arthur was an orderly man, among many in a closed and ordered society. Leaving his table was an insult to the carefully planned layout of the commons. Leaving his table was an insult to the IRS. He hoped that he would someday meet her in the halls as she mopped a floor that never got dirty. He hoped that he could tell her then to skimp on the walls and to keep her head down. For now, he was happy to see her safe and that he shared that status. About the Author M.P. Fitzgerald is an author and humorist dedicated to injecting the feverish gonzo style into fiction. You can get Memos from the Wasteland, which is the official prequel to this book, free. It contains hilariously bleak office drama, Robbie's diary, and Arthur's last letter from his father. 
get your copy, just head over to his website at mpfitzgerald.art. You'll also get free updates on future audiobooks and more. We hope you have enjoyed A Happy Bureaucracy by M.P. Fitzgerald, narrated by Gary Bennett. Text copyright 2019 by M.P. Fitzgerald. Production copyright 2021 by M.P. Fitzgerald. Music by Dustmice, available on all streaming services and dustmice.bandcamp.com.